Hello folks and welcome back to English 306, uh, the rhetoric of pop culture. In this lecture we'll be covering the dramatistic perspective and it's one of my favorites. It's right up there with neo-Aristotelian uh, perspective. It's one of the rhetorical theories that really first sort of stoked my interest in rhetoric. Uh, I got really fascinated by Kenneth Burke, a lot, as a lot of people do. Just because the theory is just so damned interesting. <laughs> it's fascinating. And the more you really start thinking about it, the more you realize there's got to be something here because it definitely seems to be true. You know, Burke seems to be on to something uh, here. You know, I often uh, uh, compare him to like uh, uh, Einstein. And what Einstein is to physics, I say Kenneth Burke is to literary uh, theory and literary criticism. I mean, he's just full of insights and even today all these years later you know we're still finding ways to apply his theories in, in interesting ways that nobody had really anticipated before so uh, hopefully you will enjoy it too now some of the questions that we, we can use the dramatistic perspective and Kenneth Burke uh, and his work to answer are first why do we follow certain rules for living as normal and desirable and uh, what do our perceptions about what do our perceptions about the justifiable motives for breaking such rules tell us about ourselves and our society? Uh, so for Sel now, uh, she really zeroes in on uh, sort of what, what we mean when we talk about drama <laughs> in kind of the colloquial sense, I would say. Uh, so when you hear somebody, you say, well, what happened at work yesterday? You know, people seem upset and you say, oh, there was a lot of drama at work yesterday. My goodness, there was just so much drama. And usually what they mean by that is, you know, some rules were broken, uh, something really un unexpected happened, so people were acting in ways that weren't considered normal. Uh, there's, there's something happened to disrupt uh, the status quo, uh, right? And you start to, you, you probably want to ask something like Burke would, would want to know. First of all, what happened? You know, tell me everything. Uh, who was there? Uh, uh, what did they do? <laughs> Why did they do that? <laughs> Where was this? When was this? So you're basically already doing uh, a dramatistic perspective, and you probably do that all the time, right? The exact um, thing I'm talking about here. Uh, so you're trying to figure out what motivated uh, somebody to act out, uh, so to speak, or to, to act in a way that was considered uh, weird somehow or, or less than, than desirable. So my guess is you've probably already done some dramatistic analysis and not even known that's what you were doing. But <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so here's our objectives. Uh, I'll try to cover the basics of Burke's theory, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got like eight books on this, so <laughs> good luck. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this dramatistic life cycle, uh, terministic screens, which are really my favorite part of the, the theory. And uh, the pentad, of course, famous pentad. And then about this concept of guilt and sin and, and transcendence, mortification, and victimage. Uh, to start us off, though, I want you just to think about a time when you watched a play, and, and hopefully you've, you've gone to see at least one play, even if it's back in, like, uh, kindergarten or something. Uh, but just think about how it's different to watch a play and what, what, what's happening on the stage uh, than just to read a story. So just think about this, these two things, reading a story versus watching a play. And don't put too much thought into it, but just see if you can make some comparisons and some contrasts and uh, come back and we'll move on. Okay. So you'll recall uh, when we studied the narrative perspective by uh, Walter Fisher, uh, he was, talk he was uh, focused on narratives, stories, storytelling, where he said that uh, we're not really rational creatures, we're really uh, guided instead by stories. And the way that works is the stories have a moral to them. And we'll, we'll, hear, the, we'll hear a story and it's got a moral to it, and then we'll use that moral to uh, make decisions, you know, make important life decisions, or even trivial stuff. <laughs> and everything will be based around stories we've heard or been exposed to. And we kind of feel like ourselves, our own life is kind of like a story playing out. Um, <clears throat> so Burke you know, at first it seems this is very similar to that in many ways. Um, you might think it's just a matter of some shifting terminology, and, you know, that's true to some extent, but um, there's some pretty critical differences between these two. And so I just think it's, it's most helpful if you, instead of thinking about stories and, and narratives 
if we think instead about dramas and try to really think about how uh, what Burke is talking about is more like a stage play and, and a, a drama, like in that sense we talked about earlier with, oh, there's a lot of drama at work <laughs> today. <laughs> so if you, if you keep that sort of, if you try to stay in that sort of mindset, this will make a lot more sense uh, than just a, a traditional story. Because uh, what we want to find is not a moral, so not, not what is the moral of a play, but <clears throat> what are the motives that are driving these, these characters' actions? You know, what motivated that particular act? And when we start to figure this out, we're going to bring in, well, it's going to be important to study the, the person that did it, uh, where, the when, and the where, and the why, and all this stuff will come together. And it's really not unlike being a detective. You know, they, they also work with uh, motives, right, and, and, and evidence, and, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how is a, a sort of the classic journalistic questions, uh, but it's also what Burke uses to talk about, you know, fictional stuff and, and dramas, or, or re uh, real life for that matter. Uh, so here's what uh, Selnow identifies as the ultimate goal of dramatism. So it's to understand what motivates people to behave in certain ways and the motives we use to justify our justify our actions, particularly when those actions conflict with society's behavioral norms. Popular culture texts viewed through a dramatistic lens function as equipment for living. By attempting to justify when and how it might be acceptable to break what Burke prescribes as society's rules for living, and consequently what we say and do to restore a sense of order. Uh, so this is really a key passage, so that's why I read it aloud to you. Uh, so you definitely want to make some notes of this if you use this perspective in your, in your essay, because this is really uh, the essence of it. And we'll see if we'll break this uh, quotation down in the rest of this lecture. Okay, uh, the dramatistic life cycle. Uh, so for Burke, kind of like with Aristotle, uh, Aristotle says that that humans are city dwellers. <laughs> we're the city dwelling people. We're, we're people. Humans are animals that live in cities. I think is his definition. And so Burke is kind of along along with that, right? There's, uh, you know, you, to to exist as a human, basically, you have to be part of a group. And what sets one group or what sets one group apart from another? Or you belong to this group. You don't belong to that other group. Uh, there will be rules, right? It says who gets to be in this group and how does this group behave and what's the right way to do x y and z in this group <laughs> you know we're totally unlike that other group over there you know they do all this stuff backwards right or they you know wear these colors instead of these colors and so on and so forth uh, so for burke that's a really big deal uh, you know you identify as a member of a group and you set yourself apart from these other groups uh, and it's just natural to want to be like this, you know, according to Burke. You want to fit in. You want to belong somewhere. You have to feel the sense of belonging to some group. Now, however, no matter how hard you try, uh, sooner or later you will do something that this group finds undesirable. Or you will be the one, you know, causing the drama uh, that we talked about. Something will happen. There's some kind of sin. Somebody's done something <laughs> wrong in the eyes of the group. And they, uh, he's this term, pollution and sin, right? There's something kind of stinky about uh, this. Uh, so you feel bad. You know, man, I wish I hadn't done that. I really just want to you know, belong to this group, but I've, I've messed up. Uh, now I've got to, you know, purify myself somehow and, and be redeemed so I can come back and, and rejoin the group again. Uh, and that's where we get to this purification process. So you can, you're probably already picking up on like a lot of the religious overtones of this. Uh, Burke is basing a lot of this on, on Catholicism, really. And you know, with Catholicism, you have this uh, business with the uh, confession and the penance, you know, and then you, you do the penance and then you're, you know, you're cleansed of your sin. <laughs> it, it's sort of similar to this, but Burke is uh, applying this more broadly. So instead of just looking at the, the Bible, let's say, we're talking about literature as a whole. Like all the literature is some kind of equipment for living. Uh, okay, so let's say you, you've done something wrong or something questionable, and now you're trying to be redeemed. So you're basically trying to get back in the good graces of, of this group that you're in. Uh, so you have three basic strategies, according to, to Burke. One is to say uh, that you're the victim here. 
<laughs> you're you're the you they call it victimage. It's somebody else's fault uh, that you might have did it, but it's not your fault that you did it. You know, some something or someone else is to blame. Uh, you know, it's the classic. Uh, you know, you, you've probably done this yourself a million times, right? It's not. Yes, I did it, but it wasn't my fault. You should blame. You know, fill in the blank. Uh, <clears throat> and she divides these into two types. Uh, the comic fools and the, and the tragic heroes. And the only difference between these really, it's not really like one's funny necessarily and, and one's sad necessarily. It's just the one, uh, the comic fools basically get away with it. You know, we, we accept that they uh, it's not their fault and it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> but, you know, they don't really get punished or have to uh, take responsibility the same way a tragic hero does. Uh, so the tragic heroes, you know, even though they might we might not consider it to be their fault that this happened, or we feel bad for them, or whatever. Uh, still, they have to be punished. Right? They don't. They don't. They don't get away with it. And she uses the examples here uh, for the comic fool. I think she uses Dennis the Menace. You know, he's just a kid. You know, kids do break rules all the time. <laughs> they do crazy stuff. <laughs> uh, but we don't really consider them evil uh, and want to banish them or anything like that. Uh, we just say kids are kids, you know. You know, it's just a little kid. Uh, give give a give a the kid a break. Come on, he's like you know four years old. <laughs> uh, so that's different than the, a tragic hero, where you might say you might feel a lot of sympathy uh, for someone uh, like these uh, Greek tragedies. Uh, uh, the classic example, I guess, would be uh, Oedipus Rex or Oedipus. <laughs> you know, you I think what is he? Uh, he marries his mother and, and kills his murders his father, kills his dad. Uh, pretty horrible stuff. You know, if you read the play, it's not really his fault either way, but still he's got to pay the price for that. Uh, so that's victimage. Uh, two, mortification is kind of, like, kind of like what we're saying with Catholicism and the confessions and the penance, right? So you say, yes, I, I confess. I, I did it. I'll take my lumps. <laughs> you know, tell me what to do. I will say the, you know, the Hail Marys. I'll, I'll do whatever. Uh, you know, if, if I'll go to prison and serve my time. I'll pick up trash, you know, whatever it is. I'm basically owning it. I want to uh, be punished, and then I want to move on. <laughs> That's mortification. Uh, and then transcendence is um, where you again you say, okay, I broke the rule, but it's you should be okay with this. Whether or not you're okay with it is beside the point because I was serving the greater good. Uh, so again, we could come back to religion. You know, think about how many times somebody breaks the law, but they say, you know, I broke the uh, law of the land, but I was serving, actually obeying this this higher law or, or this higher um, power, you know, however you want to word that. You know, there's plenty of examples of this, too, in, in classical uh, Greek tragedy. You know, there's plenty of cases. There's a story about a, a woman whose uh, brother gets killed, and he's out in the battlefield, you know, after a battle, and the king says, you can't go out and bury him. We just want to leave uh, the body out there for the birds, you know, the crows. He shouldn't have betrayed me. <laughs> uh, so we're just going to let his body rot out there. And she disobeys that. She breaks the rule. She goes out there, buries him anyway, uh, gets in trouble. And the king is like, why don't you do that? <laughs> you know, I told you not to. <laughs> I'm the king. <laughs> and she says, well, okay, you're the king, but uh, there's... And you have a law, you know, you're the king, you have the right to make laws. But you don't have the right to, for me, uh, to make me violate natural law. You know, there's a higher law than, than kingly law uh, called natural law or the law of the gods or whatever. And that says that it was, I, sh I had a higher, I had a responsibility to, to go bury my brother. And that basically trumped this uh, law that you passed just as a, as a mortal uh, king. So that'd be an example there of transcendence. Uh, okay, uh, this is my favorite uh, thing about Burke is this idea of the terministic screens, and I, 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 I was struck by this. It just so happened I was taking a course in modern rhetoric, where we talked about Kenneth Burke, and at the same time I was taking that class, I was taking another class on German history, uh, this German history class, and of course part of that covered, uh, you know, Hitler and the Nazis, and they, the professor showed us a uh, some clips from a movie or a film called Triumph of the Will, this Nazi propaganda film. Uh, so what struck me about this was, you know, was, you know I was reading about Burke, and he, he's talking about symbols and languages and how these the symbols and 
terms basically shade our a worldview it sort of creates a perspective for us and it ultimately influences our behavior in, in sort of weird ways or powerful ways and so i was thinking about this and there's a little sequence in this film uh that really struck me i mean if you ever i don't recommend watching this as a propaganda film okay uh, but just as something to analyze uh, it's full of swastikas and like eagles and all this nazi uh symbols everywhere uh, but in particular, there's a sequence where it shows you, you see all of these Nazis with these flags, these swastika flags, and it looks like, wow, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and then it's just, it keeps impressing you with like, oh, there's, there's way more than, than that even. And then they like zoom in and you see like so many of these flags that you, you don't even see the people anymore. It's just solid, like a solid mass, like these flags have come alive and, and, are, wa and are marching. And of course, it's really frightening, you know, to watch this. It makes your, you know, it's it's terrifying. But I think it's a really good example of, you know, the, these ideas of, uh, you know, the symbols and sort of identifying so strongly with a symbol that you bec actually become like a living embodiment of that sy symbol. And of course, you know, this is a, you know, in that case, a horrible, hideous uh, example of this sort of thing taking place. Uh, uh, but of course, Burke's point is, you know, we're all doing this uh, to some extent, hopefully not in a group like that. Uh, but any group would have symbols and terms and you know, people trying to identify with those symbols. Uh, so anyway, that's what struck me. And I never forgot that kind of stuck with me and I always think about it when I think about these terministic screens. I mean, it's a serious business. Uh, OK, so the terms of a terministic screen can enable or deter us to do certain things or believe in certain ways, right? Drawn to some symbols, drawn to certain ways of expressing ideas about things, worldview. And uh, basically the, the language we use or the symbols we're drawn to, you know, can either make it easier to do things or, or not, or make it harder. Excuse me. That's just an example from The Walking Dead. Uh, you know, they don't actually use the, the word zombie in that show uh, it's kind of strange almost you know they'll talk about walkers you know there's another group they, they meet and they talk about they don't call them walkers you know they call them infected other groups call them geeks you know it kind of come it's almost a little game in the walking dead and the spinoffs you know to see what what is this new group they've met what do they call them <laughs> and you think it's well it's, it's kind of neat that this one group calls them walkers and one group calls them geeks and so on or biters but if you really think about it, it's kind of suggesting how they view uh, the humanity of the zombies. Uh, so if you're calling them a walker, uh, that to me sounds like you don't really consider them a full human. You know, maybe they're, they're only human in that they're sort of walking on two legs, maybe. <laughs> they're, uh, that's a, a different kind of uh, attitude towards them than if you just called them infected. Or if you just said they're diseased. You know, these are the sick people. You know, if you say infected... Uh, to me, that sounds like you're saying they're they're a lot more human. They just you know they just happen to be infected with this terrible uh, virus or plague, or, you know whatever you want to call it. But they're still human. Uh, whereas if you're calling them something like uh, biters or you know there's, there's other words you could call them like zombie for example, uh, where it seems like you're not you're saying basically you're not even really thinking of them as as a human. You know, so your worldview at least in terms of uh, zombies is different than somebody to calling them uh, infected. It's just something to be mindful of as you're watching uh, The Walking Dead to be, uh, you know, paying attention to what they call the zombies and how they uh, phrase things. Uh, okay, some other terms of Burke. Um, he talks about clusters, groups of associated symbols that suggest what goes with what. Again, we've, we've talked about that uh, before in the context of, like, bikers, <laughs> Harley-Davidson's, and... Uh, you know, if you go to a, a game, you know, you might wear the team colors and there's, you know, the logos and symbols and a mascot, you know, and all the stuff that kind of goes along with being a, a fan of that team. Um, and there's other symbols, though, that would suggest you don't, <laughs> you're part of that other group or that other team, right? And so those are the clusters. Um, <coughs> agons are groups of symbols that reveal... Um, points of conflict by reinforcing opposites. And then frequency is how often the groups are, of clusters and agons appear. And intensity is how forcefully they are portrayed. Okay, so let me break this down a little bit. 
so here we have, I just went to Google and typed in like 4th of July and uh, looked at the photos or images and this little image popped up and I noticed there's a lot of red, white, and blue uh, there's streamers and lots and lots of uh, flags, right? I see one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven flags and maybe more if I really look closely at this. So you see there's a large frequency of flags and uh, over here uh, there's just there's a flag also but there's just one flag you know this is a famous memorial here in Iwo Jima uh, and the Marines um, but I would argue and I think you'd probably agree with this that you know in a way this one on the left the it, it's powerful because there's so it's like there's so many flags you know kind of wow that's a lot of flags <laughs> kind of makes an impact on you that way uh, whereas here there's only one flag but somehow it's really intense I mean when I look at this memorials it almost like it it stirs me emotionally just looking at this you know somehow it has this intense uh, emotional resonance even though there's only one symbol uh, so in both cases you would say these symbols are having an impact it's just a little different way that it's that it's happening um, another to jump ahead a little bit here there's an example i like to use of clusters and agons and um, when we get to the chapter on uh, feminism and this will come back because a lot of uh, this same stuff <clears throat> happens in uh, with feminism. But uh, the example I, I think about is uh, the toy aisles. <laughs> if um, you know they've they've changed this obviously in more recent times. But I don't know. I went to Google like uh, the other day. And I just typed in like boys boy toy aisle and then girl toy aisle, and I was you know looking at these these photos. And you know I won't I just try that if you if you would like and tell me what you see. <clears throat> for me, uh, what I tend to notice is that there are certain colors and uh, certain types of toys uh, and certain symbols um, that are considered, you know, normal for the boys' aisle. And then there's something similar uh, happening on, on the girls' aisle. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's a little bit strange even uh, to think about a boy aisle and, and girl aisle. And I have a lot of students that write about these, uh, the role that these toys play. Um, you know, it's basically reinforcing some of these old, uh, you know, uh, values, I guess. Uh, but anyway, it really goes to show you, like, just even like colors, like all the blue on this aisle versus all the pink on that aisle. And now that kind of suggests what is appropriate uh, toy. If, you know, if you're just there looking for a toy for, your, you know, for Christmas or <laughs> birthdays or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the, this, this, the frequency and the intensity kind of suggests to you. It kind of influences you to, to buy a toy over here, buy this toy on this aisle uh, versus that toy over on that aisle. You know, and if they, there's been experiments where they just kind of mix it up and it still kind of has that impact on people because they're associating it with the, uh, you know, again, these clusters of symbols. You think, well, it's, it's, it's here with all this other stuff, so it must be related, it must be appropriate. <clears throat> okay, God in devil terms. Uh, this kind of goes along with this idea of the the agons, I guess. But for any of these groups, there will be one set of terms that are kind of the ultimate good, uh, the ultimate sort of uh, thing that this group is all about, uh, and then there will be the opposite of that, and the most evil thing from their perspective. Here's kind of some silly examples or some fun examples, I guess. Is uh, you know heavy metal fans or metal heads, you know it, it's good when if you say something is metal. <laughs> so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, whereas something that's a fake metal, like that is the worst, you know, that's the, the poser metal, you know, it's not real metal, it's just something really hideous that you wouldn't want to be caught listening to, right? Uh, and when I've used the examples already about bikers and, and how their motorcycle is, you know, big important symbol for them. It's like the best. <laughs> this is Harley. It's a sweet ride. It's their beast. <laughs> Uh, they, and the worst is like a cage, you know, having to having to go to work in the stupid old car, you know, when they'd rather be on their bike. <laughs> uh, you know, and then the, we get to the neo-Marxism chapter. We, you can see how there, there's also devil terms in there, and like the, the bourgeoisie, you know, I mean, the capitalists are like the, the devils. You know, and then of course for the from their point of view, the, like the communists are the devils. <laughs> so you know, it kind of works uh, two ways. Uh, but that's just the god and the the devil terms, and obviously if we go back to, you know, the Catholicism, you literally have, like, things associated with the devil, 
uh, that's evil and things associated with, with God and being godly and unrighteous, uh, you know, a whole different set of symbols. You know, you think about hell, fire, <laughs> brimstone, <laughs> heaven, uh, lots of clouds, people with harps, you know, halos and, and so on. Uh, okay, Burke's Pentad. So this is the, uh, the uh, you could think about it as the journalistic questions, they call them the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, it's basically what we're talking about here. Uh, but you also want to, again, keep thinking about the dramas, the stage plays. And if you think about the way a stage play, if you've ever, re if you've ever read a play, uh, you know it's broken into acts, for example. In Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, and if you read, say, Hamlet, Shakespeare, um, or uh, these, these ancient Greek ones I was talking about, they'll be organized around acts, which will be the key thing that some character does, or the, the main thing that happens uh, in that uh, part of the play, and that will be, you know, the, the major part of that, uh, you know, uh, part, of the <laughs> part of the play, <laughs> it's the act. Uh, and same thing with all these. The agents are basically the characters, uh, the character that does the thing, uh, the act. Let me just uh, think, put it in um, to uh, Sell Now's term. So she's talking here about rule-breaking behavior. So if we go back to this scene that I had earlier with uh, here with uh, and this is in days gone by, when Rick he uh, he comes he encounters this zombie, this really sad-looking zombie that's kind of on the ground crawling, uh, looks pretty miserable. Uh, so what happens? Rick uh, later on in the in the show he goes back he finds her again and then uh, shoots her uh, with, with his pistol right so you, let's just keep that scene in mind <laughs> uh, so you'd say the act there is again he goes back there he, he shoots the um, uh, zombie lady uh, the agents obviously it's, it's Rick uh, and we could talk we could try to describe Rick you know he's in his um, I guess deputy uniform if you notice there, he's uh, you know he's he's got his full outfit on <laughs> with the star, and even that gun is kind of the, the classic sort of country western, uh, you know, Lone Ranger style uh, weapon. We'd say that's the agency. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, so the act is what happened. What was the rule that was broken? Uh, agents. That's the person that did it. Rick. Uh, agency, then, these are the tools, or in this case, the weapon, uh, that was used to bring about this act. So, you know, Rick couldn't have, uh, he couldn't have shot the zombie lady if he didn't have his, his gun on him. All right, so he needed that gun to do this. Uh, so you say he, agency in this case, was his revolver. Uh, the scene is also important in this. You know, if you recall, it's in this sort of quiet, um, I want to say like a big field or uh, park or something it seems kind of a serene uh, like scene um, and then the purpose of course is why he, he did that and he'd say he, pro he probably if you ask him why'd you do that Rick he'd probably say well to put her to, uh, to end her suffering right or <laughs> uh, to keep her from uh, I guess presenting a danger to somebody uh, that might come along this trail at some future point right or uh, something along those lines And again, this could break down into who, the agent, what, or who who did it, and what happened, and be the act, uh, when and where, uh, goes into scene, um, how how they do it, agency, and then why they do it, purpose. Okay, but remember for Burke, it's not just the purpose, or he's not a, uh, you know, he wants to know the motives. Like, what is ultimately motivating? Uh, these folks or these characters or agents to, to do the things they do. So it's not just the immediate uh, reason for it, but sort of their, what is their broader reason, their philosophical uh, perspective on that, their ethic, ethical reason uh, that brings Rick back. You know, if you think about it, it's a lot of trouble for Rick to go all the way back there and, you know, and, and shoot this, this zombie. He could have just gone on about his business. Uh, there must be something powerful motivating him uh, to want to go back and, and do this thing. And I say rule-breaking behavior here because, you know, obviously, you know, he would never do this ordinarily, but th these are extreme times in this uh, you know, post-apocalyptic post world. We'll talk about that in a second here. Um, 
so again, the, the purpose, he might just say, well, I did it to end her suffering. Uh, but the motive might be something like, it's, uh, you know, it's important to try to do good in the world. I'm a, I'm a sheriff or I'm a deputy. I have a, a moral code of protect and serve. You know, and in this case, um, I protecting and serving uh, this community from, uh, you know, by dispatching the zombie, you know, it could be something like that. Uh, it could be just a view that, you know, you shouldn't let people suffer. You, sh you should take some responsibility. You should, uh, you know, step up to the plate in these cases. You know, obviously he thinks that it's okay to, uh, to kill the zombie, if that's even the right word, because he says, it's not a, this is not a human anymore. Uh, this is just a, a suffering creature, let, let's say. Uh, so that would be something more like the motive, trying to get at the sort of moral aspect to it, a uh, philosophical view, an ethical uh, perspective on it. And that's different than just the immediate purpose. Now, I'll give you one more example that I think that makes this pretty clear. Uh, so Sal now talks about uh, Les Miserables. And I guess the, the scene was stealing some bread to feed a kid. Uh, so you say, why'd you steal the bread? Well, the purpose was to feed the starving kid. Okay, that's just the, the immediate purpose. Uh, but the motive might be something more like it's it's wrong, or it's, uh, you know, it's wrong to let a kid starve, and you have to do whatever you can, break any other rules, whatever is there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's more important to, we have this responsibility as adults to uh, kids to keep them safe and keep them, uh, you know, in that case, from, from starving to death. You know, and that, that motive is stronger than the motive to obey the law. Okay. Uh, so this story gets kind of interesting. Uh, so you don't just take these, the who, what, when, where, you know, those, those elements of the pentad separately. Uh, instead, what you want to do is start playing around with them uh, when you're looking at these scenes and thinking about you know, which two really stand out, which two are really important. And then the first one, what they say, encapsulate or contain the second one and almost be like a cause-effect relationship. And this is where it really gets fun. And I've got a, a blog I like to show that exemplifies these. All right, so here is the blog. Let's see, Regan Fox, Ragan, Regan, uh, professor of communication at California State University. Uh, but what he's done here, he's taken all, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'll, you know, put a link to this somewhere. Or you can just look up uh, Reagan Fox and Pin, uh, Pintad. But he's basically done all the work for you and provided examples for each of these ratios. And so, for example, if you put scene first and then the act second. So the scene, again, is like, where did this take place, when? And the act is, what what'd you do? So he says, if you do it this way, you're saying that the scene here, since it comes first, determines the action. So it kind of encapsulates the action, kind of causes the action. So the ominous cliff compelled him to kill himself. So you might have a play where it's all, I guess this, this, this cliff just looks so ominous, it kind of causes you to do these things. Or sometimes people talk about the... Uh, you know, something about being in this beautiful garden, you know, that, that was just such a romantic scene, you know, that's just what, you know, I just had to kiss you, <laughs> right? It was this, the, the beauty of the garden or whatever. Uh, so you can, you can sort of say that the, the scene sort of determined that, right? And Reagan, or Fox, I guess, uh, goes on with all the different possibilities of that uh, scene agency, uh, scene purpose, so let's look at this one. The location determines what a person hopes to accomplish. Uh, I work at a restaurant. My goal is to make you happy, you know, since you're in that scene. Of course, the, the scene for The Walking Dead, you know, this, this post-apocalyptic scenario, uh, that's going to make change up a lot of these <laughs> factors, right? <laughs> the same behavior, or the same person. Uh, you know, think about Rick, for example. I mean, I'm sure you get to see a little bit of Rick before the... Uh, you know, zombie day or whatever they, they call it, uh, he changes quite a bit, right, as a response to that scene. He wouldn't be the same Rick if you just put him into a regular show where there was no zombie. At least we hope he wouldn't be the same. <laughs> uh, but in some ways, that scene, uh, the, the apocalyptic scenario sort of changes who he is, right? It, so we could look at the scene and agent, and you could say, really, this 
this uh, scene sort of changes who Rick is. He becomes a different person as a response of being in that in that scene. And so I'm just showing you a couple of these, but as you can see, there's uh, many different combinations. And what you'd want to do is go through this list and see which one seems to make the most sense to you. And, and sometimes it, you know, there could be several that apply. You know, it's not like there's just one that's really going to be uh, clearly the winner. Uh, but you know, the purpose is just just look at the different possibilities there and think about it and see if it helps you to understand what's motivating Rick you know, in that circumstance. I think, you know, I really strongly think that uh, in Rick's case there, the scene uh, really has a big role in that, right? The, uh, the fact that it's an apocalypse. <laughs> now, okay, so when you want to do a, an analysis uh, with a dramatistic perspective, uh, first think about some key rule-breaking behavior you know, something a character, some kind of drama, right? Something's not, it's just not life as usual. It's not normal life. It's not just regular day at the office. You know, something has happened that's created some kind of stir. You know, somebody has done something. And so that's where you start. And you think about that act. Uh, then describe, you know, what is this rule? What is this act you're talking about? Um, who's involved? The agents. And again, try to give a pretty good description of the character. Uh, the agency, again, how did they do it? What tools did they use? You know, again, in The Walking Dead, its agency is revealed in the weapons uh, that the characters will choose. Uh, I mean, like uh, Rick's got that revolver. Uh, other characters, like Carol's got like a, uh, I guess, a, I forget, like a trench knife, I think's the name of that. But it's like a knife with, with the brass knuckles built into it. <laughs> Of course, there's the character later on in the show that has a, a baseball bat with like a barbed wire wrapped around it. <laughs> it kind of reveals something about that person, right? That that's the weapon uh, he chooses to use. Uh, so that's the sort of thing you think about with agency. Uh, scene, you know, we, we talked about this. You got the post-apocalyptic thing going, but oh, you know, it could also be relevant. You know, where is this taking place? Is it a church? Is it a you know, is it a, an old house out in the woods somewhere? Uh, the purpose, again, why are they doing that thing? Uh, you take those ratios, you go through that list of, I showed you just a minute ago, and you see which ones make the most sense, where can you figure out the most justifiable reasons for that behavior, uh, and then you evaluate the text like we've been doing with all the other ones, right? Well, what is the, the value here? Why study this particular text? Uh, what are the messages here? Would we be better off if everybody watched this show and, and agreed with the values being, um, with the motives, I guess, in this case, that are transpiring in this scene? Do we, do we want people to <laughs> be like Rick, <laughs> you know, and, and and use these this literature, or the, this television show as a, you know, as equipment for living? Or do we think this is, you know, bad and, and nobody should watch this show or <laughs> it's morally reprehensible? Okay. Uh, so just uh, to finish up here, I want you to see if you can start applying Burke's perspective. Uh, you don't have to write a whole bunch, you know, but try to you know write at least a couple. Let's just, let's just say about a hundred words on this. And so compare and contrast that scene in Days Gone By. So what you have is Rick. Um, they sort of they sort of make a montage or the, what's the word for this? Like juxtaposing or switching back and forth. You see Rick going back to the where this zombie uh, lady is in the field. And he goes back there to you know, end, end her suffering, let's say. Uh, and at the same time that's going on, they sort of flash back and forth between Rick going there. And then they'll show Morgan uh, in, in his house with Dwayne downstairs. And he's got a, I guess, sort of a rifle. You know, and he's, <laughs> you know, he's trying to decide or, I guess, you know, we'll go back and watch the scene if you don't remember exactly what happens. But, you know, he's kind of got his uh, act uh, or failure to act, you know, you could also say that his failure to act is, you know, in itself a decision, uh, an act, but, uh, you know, it, it's, in some ways these are similar scenarios, but they're also quite different. So I think it'd be very helpful for you uh, to look at those two scenes and think about those uh, act, agents, agency, and all that stuff, and, and think about how they're different, what's similar, what's uh, not, you know, uh, compare and contrast it, and see if that helps you to understand like, why was it that Rick uh, was successful, I guess, if you want to use that word, but he was motivated to uh, shoot the zombie lady, uh, but Morgan was not. You know, so his something else was motivating him. 
uh, so see, or, or something else was motivating him not to go through with it. Uh, so again, compare and contrast those. Use the pentads and the ratios, and you know, just do the best you can with it. I know it's going to be kind of tough, uh, but just try your best and have some fun with it, maybe. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up here. Uh, okay, uh, a lot of content here in this uh, lecture. I realize that. I hope you will are reading the chapter, especially those sample essays. Definitely want to look at those carefully to see how to, you know, actually model your essay. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments, things we didn't get to in this lecture, please let me know. Love to read those, and I'll see you next time.